uh, announcement from the organizers. Uh, uh, right now in Esquire, we also have uh, the lightning talk starting. Uh, of course, it's competing with this session, so I'm sure you don't want to go anywhere, but, uh, but if that's what you want to go for, lightning talk starting now as well at 3.30. Should we start? Shows that there's one more minute to go, but I think we should get started. Yeah? Okay. All right. So, so welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Tarang Bakshi. Uh, I work for ThoughtWorks uh, out of their New York office. Uh, I'm a business analyst, uh, project manager. Um, I've been uh, with, with ThoughtWorks for a while, about seven years or so. So, so that's the extent of my experience <coughs> with, uh, with distributed agile as well, because ThoughtWorks has been doing it forever, for about 12 years at least. Um, so so that, yeah, that's me. And uh, I'm Chirag. I've been a programmer uh, and, and project manager. Uh, and, and we too have we've been working on distributed development uh, projects in ThoughtWorks and, and even before, uh, for about eight to nine years now. Okay, so we're going to talk about uh, just some uh, practical tips uh, that we've, we've sort of learned uh, over the years of uh, doing distributed agile uh, on uh, you know, how to set, set these projects up uh, for success. So, so what, we're, uh, what we're going to look at is uh, a, a few, few different stages. And in fact, starting all the way from even before you starting out on a distributed project, uh, we'll start with looking at what should you even consider uh, to sort of qualify whether that sort of project is uh, you know, it makes sense to, to do in a distributed way, particularly in an offshore, offshore scenario. So that's where we'll start. Uh, we'll move on to once you've decided that, yes, it makes sense, this project should be done distributed uh, offshore, uh, then, you know, kicking off the project, uh, also called an inception. What are some of the things, uh, you know, we've learned things to consider when, uh, when kicking off such a project? Uh, what are uh, some of the things to think about, uh, mistakes to avoid maybe when, when setting up the delivery model for such projects once you're done with that kickoff and you've, you've got some uh, information from the inception? And uh, you know, in the early days of, of executing delivery on, on such a project, again, some, some things we've learned, some things to, to watch out for. Uh, and very briefly, we'll touch on you know, just some, uh, you know, some thoughts and ideas uh, for, for a steady state. Uh, but uh, you know, really, it's about the stages leading up to that, uh, because that's where we find uh, some of the biggest, uh, you know, uh, things to, to to consider, things to work on, th things where things would go wrong if you haven't thought about uh, many aspects uh, of this. Just a, just a quick check: How many people in this room have worked on distributed agile projects? Uh, a big majority. And how many of you have been doing it for years? Two, three, four years. Okay, so uh, lots of you. Um, so, so hopefully some of the insights uh, we share, you you would have uh, noticed it yourself. But, uh, but, but, yeah. I mean, from our from our experience, we feel like there are small, subtle things that sometimes get missed out, and they make a huge difference. So that's that's our attempt with this talk. Uh, and just for to make things simple, um, you know, we'll we'll keep talking about a lot of a uh, lot of different things. So the scenario to have in your head. Is that let's let's just imagine there's a there's a project that you want to uh, you know get started. Uh, it's distributed between uh, it's meant to be distributed between development teams in India and the U.S. Yeah, and there will be active development in in both locations. So that's the sort of scenario that most of our points will will sort of apply to. But of course, it could just apply you know in, in lots of other variations. You could have more than two locations. You could have a primarily offshore team. With, with just some uh, you know support uh, support functions uh, on shore, but but just keep that scenario in mind. Okay, so let's let's get started with uh, with qualifying the fitment, uh, right? When um, so I, so I've been on a uh, on a few projects where one project in particular I can give you an example. Uh, I walked in uh, to the uh, to the customer location uh, on site. The project had been going on for about two or three months, um, and I happened to sit down with the head of product who was. Uh, you know, pretty much uh, behind the vision for the product that we were building was was largely driving our requirements. Uh, and I made a suggestion that hey, we have some business analysts uh, in our uh, in our Pune office uh, who'd love to catch up with you, understand some some context on uh, on what we are building. You know, these features that you that you want uh, coming up next, we'd we'd love some uh, input directly from you. The response was 
oh, I don't think I need to talk to anyone sitting offshore. I'd rather talk to you while you're here. Uh, you know, offshore is a decision that IT has made. I have nothing to do with it. You know, so don't, don't ask me to get on calls in the morning uh, or late nights. I'm not willing to do that. So, so and, and there have been a few incidents like that, and it just made me think, oh man, I wish I was involved in, you know, when this project was being sold, you know, to make sure that some of the expectations were set right. Uh, because one of the, the, the questions that we, you know, we, uh, we, we really, there are a few different questions that we're, that we're asking there. One is, what's, uh, you know, what's, your, what's the driver, why are you going offshore, why are you going distributed, why, you know, what's, what's driving it? Uh, of course, the, the obvious answer in, in many cases is cost, right? Uh, you know, people are going offshore uh, to, to India, Brazil, all of these locations, largely for, or primarily for cost, it's not unusual. But at ThoughtWorks, that's something often would be a red flag for us. Uh, if, we, if we were having a conversation and the desire to go offshore was primarily or only driven by cost, uh, that would be a red flag for us because there are again the risks that come with that. One risk being that you know if, if it's just a cost play, then it could mean that potentially lower value work uh, is going to come uh, to the offshore team. Potentially, it could mean that uh, you know there isn't uh, uh, a lot of there isn't a lot of buy-in about the talent uh, that ThoughtWorks is bringing to the table. It's really hourly rates. Oh, okay, this hourly rate is a fraction of that hourly rate, uh, and that's where we're going. So ideally, we're looking for some other reasons. We're looking for, okay, you want to go offshore or you want to distribute for scale. Okay, you need to ramp up. You need to get a complex product out really quickly. You need to scale. Great, we have, we have lots of locations uh, you know, offshore that can help with that. Or maybe you're looking for specific skill sets or talents, uh, maybe some specialist uh, you know, experience with, with mobile applications, uh, with, with Hive, Hadoop, some of those. So those are some of the reasons that we are looking for. So, so we, do, we do vet for you know, what's the driver, why are you choosing to to distribute or, or go offshore. And, and if the driver isn't, you know, if it doesn't feel quite right, the answer isn't always to say, hey, yeah, we don't want to work with you. But it's to, it's to say, okay, you know, let's spend some time with, with the client stakeholders initially to set the expectations right, to, to get them to understand that they'll have to think about things differently, invest, uh, not in terms of money, but in terms of effort and time uh, from their side differently. So the other one is, is there business buying? That's the example I, I gave you, right? Is it just IT that's bought in, the IT organization that you know, uh, has, uh, has bought in and said, yeah, we're going to go to, go to distribute it. Uh, if product has, you know, has, no one has had a conversation with product or with business saying, what does going distributed mean for you? What does it mean in terms of how you will interact with people? What might it mean in terms of stretch into early morning calls, late evening calls? If those conversations have not happened, Again, it will be a red flag for us because it will mean that likely we will hit into, into problems later because uh, if the default model is to have on-site proxies for an offshore team, then again, that's a model that we find can very easily fail. It's a, it's a riskier model. We would much rather have all the key stakeholders directly uh, having conversations with, uh, with our teams, our development teams sitting wherever they are, whether they are sitting in Brazil or India uh, or, or anywhere else. Uh, and, and the third thing uh, we, we, we look for uh, in these cases is, are there big unknowns? Is the, is the product vision, for example, extremely ambiguous? Is, it, is there a lot of discovery to be done? Is there some, some big uh, you know, chunks that you need to have some validated learning to be done quickly? Uh, in those sort of cases, especially, or if there's technical, a lot of technical risk, a lot of unknowns around uh, you know, interfaces or around technical risk, we'll ask the question saying, does it really make sense to start uh, you know, with, with offshore or distributed on day one, maybe uh, we should look at, you know, can we start with, with a small co-located team that can get some of the unknowns uncovered pretty quickly. Uh, and then as part of that exercise, we will also look for ways to distribute uh, this effort to multiple locations. But let's not start uh, assuming that, you know, from day one this can work offshore. Because typically, again, it will mean that some of those goals or objectives won't be met. So let's let's talk about the next phase of uh, of uh, of this process when you are trying to kick off the project. If you're trying to understand, uh, you know, what the project is about, what the goal is, and and so on, we uh, we typically call this the inception stage. But think of it as the first few weeks when you're trying to understand broadly what what the team's supposed to do. So, and typically, you, you know, so you, you do that in a co-located fashion with the client stakeholders. And, and f uh, from, from our experience, it's really important that this team who, 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 who goes and meets the client stakeholders to understand the project 
uh, broadly needs to have cross functional representation from all the locations you know, uh, from both locations in in this particular scenario so it's important that you have uh, you know business analyst as well as bas as well uh, as well as devs as well as qas from both location an anti pattern that we've seen sometimes is that oh, you know let's let's get the bas from offshore and and the architect or the senior developers from onshore and that's enough uh, to uh, to you know that 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 is enough maybe to to carve out the initial design and so on but what that creates is a big gap in understanding and buy in from the team on the other side and and when when i talk of that what what it means is that you have a team of 5 6 uh, people coming from different regions even if they are from the same organization they they they've been working in different offices different regions so it's possible that they've never met each other they've never interacted with each other and so it's really important that that team gets together a few days before ideally one or two days before the the kick off uh, with the with the clients uh, you know is starting but at least get together you know one evening before you know meet up informally get to know each other a little bit because otherwise it's very difficult to function as 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 one unified team on on the first few days of of that inception workshops so my uh, most interesting experience for me on this one was i landed up at a client site uh, on monday you know on a monday morning uh, at at 9 a.m. Uh, and uh, there, there were four other people uh, who had come in to join me. We were going to run this inception. The kickoff was at was at ten in the morning, and there were people from three different three other continents. You know, it just so happened that availability meant that there were four of us, four you know people from different four different continents meeting up for the first time. We'd never worked with each other. We never knew each other, uh, and we were going. To, you know, we were involved with planning the inception activities, but we had not met face to face. So at ten a.m. here, we were going to do a kickoff with the client, try and wow them and impress them. Uh, you know, try and run some visioning sessions with them, uh, and it was a challenge. I mean, if, if we didn't even know the people that are part of our organization and we were working with, uh, it was always going to be harder to make it look slick, to make it look, uh, to make it actually work smoothly. So, so one of the things we do now is is make sure that the team can be together one or two days, or even one day in advance, or at least a half day in advance, before there is any in interfacing with the actual uh, client stakeholders or business stakeholders uh, on day one. So the other aspect uh, f for both of us who've primarily been part of offshore teams uh, during our career, it's it's very important for the offshore team members to make that additional effort to build uh, customer, you know, build build confidence and comfort uh, with the, you know with the customer team, and and this means you know simple things like. Uh, like people from the offshore team taking lead in driving some of the sessions in in you know in in facilitating some of the exercises and and so on um, and while people from the on site team who are who are likely to be more co-located with the customers you know going going forward on the project anyways they take a bit of a back seat and and allow the people from offshore to drive and this creates again you know some amount of confidence amount of comfort and familiarity which really helps when the project actually gets kicked off and 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 you know we are back in india and interacting over uh, you know interacting remotely so I, this initial time spent in front and center of the room is really critical so so we've uh, you know we we've qualified uh, the project yeah it looks like it's a good one we should go distribute it we've we've kicked it off uh, we've understood enough about uh, you know about the vision, about the architecture, the the requirements, and now we we need to set up delivery. So so again, so what are what are some things uh, to think about? Uh, this one may seem obvious. Uh, we talked about it in the inception team, but it should, you know the the big you know, clear uh, lesson for us uh, here is that every location that is doing you know is involved in the development needs to have a cross-functional team. Uh, we've seen it at many client uh, client organizations where they try to do distribute it with with the QA team. Uh, you know, a test team sitting in one location, uh, you know, some developer sitting somewhere else, an architect, uh, you know, sitting somewhere else, and a project manager at the, at the customer location. And, uh, you know, that's, that's a big uh, dysfunction um, uh, for us. So, so every, every distributed project where we, there is going to be uh, active development uh, in, in multiple locations, we try to make sure there's cross-functional roles, including user experience, uh, designers if needed, but we'll try and make sure that there is no specialist role that only exists uh, in one location. Uh, 
the other thing to think about, and this one is interesting, uh, it's, uh, we've, we've learned this lesson the hard way, it's balance of power. Uh, what, what we mean uh, by this is that uh, uh, we, we do insist that every location is, has an equal role in any decision making that happens about the project. There is an obvious, easy, convenient thing, right? Hey, I've got four or five people sitting in my, my office uh, as a client. Uh, you know, I've got developers, I've got BAs, I've got QAs. You know, we need to make lots of decisions about this project. We need to move things fast. So the convenient thing is, yeah, you know what, let's talk you know, while we're all sitting in one room, make a decision and convey that to the offshore teams. Uh, you know, absolute recipe uh, for disaster. Uh, it, we've, you know, we've even seen that with, with our own, own teams where if you've not very clearly established that you know, the, the, the people onshore at client side and offshore you know, share responsibilities, it very quickly becomes a case where the folks offshore are story monkeys, have got, you know, have got development tasks that they execute but have very little say in design and architecture. Uh, you know, user experience is handed over to them to simply implement. Uh, so this is something that you know, it's in, in the last couple of years at least we've become very sensitive about and making sure that with our own onshore teams as well as client folks, we very clearly said you know, any decision making that needs to happen needs to be collaborative, needs to involve all locations including offshore locations. Yes, there is a trade-off. Uh, it means that decision making cycles for a lot of things will become much longer. You know, 24 hour plus cycles for something that would otherwise have taken you know, an hour in a meeting room. But that is the trade-off that comes with, with going distributed. There is no way out of that. If you need to have motivated teams uh, you know, delivering offshore, there has to be this balance of power. And, and of course, we believe that that makes for better decisions as well in most cases because people at the offshore team have different and you know, unique insights sometimes on the code base or, or on the product. So an example actually I want to share uh, on, on that one is um, uh, so I, this was a learning for me as well. Uh, so I, I, I was on a, on a team um, as, as a business analyst uh, offshore, um, and I and I happened I moved onshore uh, because there was a role uh, needed there to support the offshore delivery team. Uh, and I went onshore and I was like, yeah, okay, all, all the customer stakeholders are here, all the all the people who do the requirements are here. So my daily cycle was, you know, sit with all the business and product folks, understand the requirements on new features. End of the day, you know, get on a phone call or type up a long email as a brain dump. And then the, the BAs offshore would, would write up user stories based on that. They would come back with questions and I would forward the questions uh, you know, to the product and business folks. And very quickly it became impossible to work in that way. I just didn't realize what impact that was, you know, that meant for the teams offshore. So when we, then we, had to move, we ended up moving to a model where it, uh, my role I looked at is it's a facilitator onshore. The requirement conversations from the absolute beginning were being driven from offshore. I just had to make sure that the stakeholders on the customer side, you know, if they needed some prodding, if they needed some follow-ups, I was there to do that. But I didn't know enough about the big picture requirements to even, you know, even provide a brain dump. So I you know, sort of had to move, move out of that role. And this is something that's come as a learning that we, you know, we need to do that. Onshore roles don't necessarily, uh, you know, mean that those are the ones with all the, the meaty information and offshore has, you know, got all the scribing and, uh, and, and low-level work to do. How does the offshore team actually communicate with the stakeholders? We do, yeah, yeah. We had to make two our windows uh, that, that allowed for that. And we'll talk about that uh, as we go. The, the other thing that's really important while, while uh, trying to set up a distributed development team is, uh, is to figure out how to split up work. What kind of work should be done in one location versus the other? And, and here our, our uh, strong recommendation is to ensure that work is split uh, vertically, meaning you, you carve out a set of features and, uh, and, and make the offshore team the owners for those set of features, carve out a different set of features and, uh, and make the on-site on team the owners for those. Uh, you know, anti-patterns that uh, I'm sure a lot of you guys may have seen or experienced is uh, all the UI work will be done in one city and all the services will be written in another city or all the development work will be done in one city and testing work will, done, will be done in another city. That, uh, in our experience, uh, doesn't, doesn't work. Um, and, 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 you know, connecting it to the earlier point of cross-functional role. So it's really important for teams to be able to own features end-to-end, -end, both in terms of uh, all stacks of the architecture, as many stacks of the architecture as possible, but also in terms of, uh, you know, analysis to 
uh, requirement understanding and analysis to uh, to deployment so you you keep it such that every team is fully set up to be able to do any of these uh, stages themselves and related to that is that it's it's important that the uh, that the split of features is done in a in a fashion where uh, features that are connected or correlated in some fashion are are grouped together and 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 you know handed over to each of these teams and this i think is really important because uh, it it usually um, features that are correlated are also correlated in inside the code base maybe you know in in the sense that they'll use similar classes and and methods same same classes and methods and it's important to to keep that in mind while you are while you are making these decisions because uh, one of the most difficult things in working distributed is if you have day to day code level um, you know dependencies you know on on a daily basis if you're working on the same set of classes or methods that that a team on the other side is also working on then it can it can cause a lot of confusion it it can cause a lot of uh, extra communication overhead and so on so it's important to to split up to 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 you know logically pick up features such that different areas of the code bases will automatically uh, be owned by different parts of the uh, two teams sorry yeah uh, I, I, module wise split up is a is a separate you know we can talk about it more offline uh, but the here what i'm suggesting is end to end you know, end-to-end -end split up, not just some components yeah. owned by some teams. You know, there, there is an obvious risk, right? You're going to say if you split up by uh, by you know features that are closely related, there is a risk of uh, you know being being uh, getting into a state where there are silos, where there is not enough knowledge about one set of things, one set of features in your code base, uh, you know, in another location. So, so we are always conscious of this risk, but but we find that the trade-off between the the chaos and confusion of day-to-day -day dependencies versus you know, the some risk of uh, of some you know knowledge being be getting into silos. We find that uh, we, we tend to uh, go towards uh, actually splitting that up and finding ways to consciously uh, have knowledge shared between among those features, either by swapping people uh, across teams or or finding other ways to do that. The yeah, I think the here it's also about the related features uh, that you want to want to group together. You could one potentially you could just say here are vertical slices, and we can in uh, you know arbitrarily assign those or have teams pick them up from a common backlog. What we're saying is no, there is some active effort to say that these groups of things are actually related to each other. They'll touch in you know, all of the same underlying uh, underlying code. So maybe it's best that one location uh, owns it rather than arbitrarily dividing it. I mean, the, the classic anti-pattern that I've seen, uh, you know, seen just too many times uh, is that uh, the team works off a shared backlog, which is which is fine, but it's all, almost random that if if team A finishes their story today, they'll pick up whatever is the next most important story in that common backlog right now, regardless of which feature it, it belongs to, which area of code base it belongs to. And uh, and team B, when it finishes their story on the next day, they will pick up, you know, another story which maybe is related to that, you know, story that the team A just picked up. And so that just is is uh, is too confusing, too uh, costly, in terms of the communication overhead that it creates. And while I you know, while we talk about this separation of of uh, of ownership of features and and end to end uh, you know uh, ownership of features, we we still you know just to just to clarify, we're still talking of uh, us you know very 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 frequent integrations. Is st still talking about one single continuous integration pipeline, one single continuous deployment pipeline. So it's not as if the the intent is for the two teams to work independently. Uh, you know, uh, at, at all. So uh, continuously, you are checking every check-in works against the combined code base, and you know all the integration tests uh, work against the combined code base at all times. Do you have between the teams? Yeah, we'll we'll talk about that. Yes. Okay. So uh, another one, and uh, almost. Um, it, it might sound like it's a counter, you know, counterpoint, but it's not. It's the uh, when it comes to uh, you know things like metrics, when it comes to 
uh, things like uh, you know managing the teams. One of the things we we do uh, focus on is making sure it's treated as one team. Uh, we've you know we've been badly burned by going down the path of uh, oh onshore velocity is four points uh, per week per pair, but offshore is two points per pair per week. What is going on? Why is offshore half as productive? I mean it's. It, I mean, Aside from the point that that sort of use of velocity itself is uh, is, is is dysfunctional, uh, you know, just trying to do that and, and separating those and, and treating them as oh, I have an onshore team and an offshore team. I think we we found that to be extremely risky and a really bad idea. So we we will try to look, make sure it's it's considered by client stakeholders, by you know our own teams as a single unified team. We're not trying to create uh, divisions other than for purely practical reasons like uh, you know dividing up features and things like that distributed, then it will obviously happen, right? The data will itself speak like that. But the, you can get, so the question is if the features are distributed toward the data, yeah, the data will, may, may tell you something like that, but there's no reason to actually uh, track it that way. It's a team, well, it's a team velocity, it's a team planning effort, it's a team output that we're doing. So, so while the temptation may be there, all we're saying is that resist the temptation to, to try and look at the data as, oh, this is my velocity in Chennai, this is my velocity in New York, and so on. We'll, yeah, we'll actually, we might not have time to talk about it, but, but offline we can, we can do this. Okay, and uh, um, the next, uh, next thing I want to talk about is, so, so now we've set this delivery up, right? Uh, we've, we've now uh, gotten into active uh, delivery, our sprints or iterations have begun. Uh, so so what, what's, what's some of the, some things to think about and plan for in the early days? Now rotations is the most obvious one, right? There was, you know, stuff when uh, you know, there were articles 10 years ago about distributed agile, the first thing in there was uh, about rotations of people. But, but even today we find that uh, there are a couple of things. One is rotations only seem to happen in one direction, which is from offshore, uh, you have people traveling uh, to, to customer locations, that's one. And the other is that rotations tend to be, oh, I made a two week trip uh, to the customer site. Uh, and you know, that's, that's why we're doing rotations. Uh, in, in our world, rotations would mean working for a reasonable period of time in on the other location. Uh, so it would be you know, six weeks, eight weeks, two months, three months, and we will try to do it in both directions. So we'll plan on that if that needs to be some budgeting uh, thing that needs to be done to make sure that our developers from, from onshore, our BAs, our you know, project manager can spend a few weeks in our offshore locations. So whatever it takes, the visas, things that needs to happen, the, the monetary allocation, we'll, we'll try and make sure that those rotations are planned in both directions. But the, but the key word there is working from, you know, getting the experience of actually working from the other location is, is critical. It's, uh, it's one thing to meet people face to face and, you know, uh, conduct uh, discussions and, and sessions and so on, but it's completely another thing to, to actually work uh, on a day to day basis from the other location. So that gives, gives uh, both teams a lot of insights. I think the, that goes a big way towards that empathy and the trust uh, that, that needs to be built across those locations. And it doesn't matter whether, uh, you know, for in the ThoughtWorks world, there could sometimes be client developers, client VAs, and so on. So if we could do a co-source co model, we'll try and get everybody over uh, if we can. doesn't matter whether they're from ThoughtWorks or from the client organization. Uh, this one, again, might seem obvious, uh, but it's, um, it's shocking, uh, you know, how, how frequently we have distributed projects start off where you know the classic conference call you would have seen the recent video that became very popular but um, you know somehow even though this idea has been around for you know, probably a couple of couple of decades but but by default using video uh, for all distributed communication we'll, we will will you know spend a lot of effort making sure that's the habit from day one uh, and the default and whether that's supplemented with screen sharing and document sharing but we'll get into that default habit of, hey, everything needs to be, we need to be able to see each other, and we need to be able to look at the same thing that we're working on together. Uh, we're just not going to do, uh, you know, uh, conference calls uh, alone. Uh, so on most tables, you'll find, uh, you know, because this is a topic that we can't probably spend a lot of time on just different synchronous and asynchronous communication options. So most tables, you'll find there are some, a bunch of handouts. Uh, so that's, you know, you can, you can take those away. There are some more details there about hardware, software, ways we've used uh, things for uh, for distributed communication. 
Yeah, but this one we can't stress on enough. Uh, you, know, you know, these days, in in my view, these tools, the bandwidth, uh, you know, on on both location has improved so much that if you use video and supplementary tools like screen sharing and uh, and collaborative uh, document editing tools and 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 so on, well, uh, you know, with good hardware as well, then it can very closely re replicate being there. Uh, in the in the other location. And for those in the back, if you don't have a handout, we have a few extra here. So if there are any left at the table at the end of the session, we can we can give those to you as well as these ones. Okay. Okay. Um, so the uh, the the so the idea of uh, that that this is still one team that is it just happens that a few of the members are in one city and the few are in another is. Uh, is important to keep in mind, and and when you when you think of that, uh, it's important for both the teams to get to to try and get to know people on the other side uh, as people, as as human beings. And there are just some small things that you can do in the early days that uh, that help towards that. So, so you know, on on one of our projects, um, our project manager in UK asked us to send pictures of everyone uh, who's who was on the on offshore team and he he put them up on walls um, at the client office uh, you know with with names and roles and so on and that you know and, and he got feedback from clients saying oh i've been talking to chirag for the last few days but now that i see his face um, you know, it just it just feels better uh, I have I've seen other teams do do you know other informal things like share um, you know share their hobbies you know in in a mail thread or or share something like that. But those sort of inf you know informal communication between these two teams really helps. And um, I've I've used on on some teams tools like Yammer or or Skype chat rooms or uh, or IRC chat and and stuff like that. To, to of course you know talk about what's going on on a day to day basis on the project but when you have tools like that which is not email which is not formal then you can you can do other interesting things you can you know wish people on their birthdays you can uh, you can share jokes you can pull people's leg and and so on which connect the people on both sides uh, on a, on a human basis which helps in you know when there are tougher times it helps in that and this can be a little tricky, right? If you're in the, in the scenario we talked about, it's a US-India distribution. We're barely getting, you know, one one and a half hours of overlap time. So, you know, it, it you know, it, the obvious urge is that uh, you know, let's let's just keep it to business. If you're talking for an hour and a half, you know, let's just do that. But uh, you know, but one of our our mantras there is, uh, you know, make time for banter, make time for that informal. It doesn't matter if there's something uh, you know about the project that that has to be done over email later. But in the early days, that sort of getting to know people and and uh, you know, getting to know them as human beings is, is critical to the success of the project. And uh, the the other uh, thing is that if you are one of the one of the folks on on the offshore team who's got initially the time to uh, the face to face time with uh, with people on the other team, then uh, then you know you ought to take that additional responsibility to to get get your other team members to get to know these people better. So. So it's it's about you know sharing anecdotes about uh, you know about your trip uh, that that you made on uh, you know over there and what did that person say what is that person interested in just you know connect connect people up you, you know you have that additional responsibility if you have met them face to face. This is this is similar to the you know the the ideas that we've talked earlier about uh, balance of power and 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 you know having that sense of uh, shared ownership between the two teams, but uh, but oftentimes we you know we've seen teams default to okay you know I'm I'm at on site and you know here here are five client stakeholders who are sitting in the same room so let me drive every single uh, every single meeting every single you know, showcase. Uh, I am the best person to drive it, and and while that is true from you know from a practical point of view, it is really important for the offshore team members to to drive you know uh, some or most of these meetings directly from from offshore. And again, you know, with the tools and hardware that is available now, it it isn't that uh, you know it isn't that 
big a difference in, in experience. So again, you know, the, the idea is that the offshore team members should drive these communication and the onshore team members uh, should be there in case uh, in case of a communication, you know, in case of a hardware failure. So if, uh, if the network goes down or something like that, then the person can, can rescue that situation by, by telling some jokes or, or maybe by, uh, you know, by, by continuing through that presentation later on. So we, we use this for uh, you know, showcases for sure. We'll have most showcases to client folks made, uh, you know, driven by offshore. Uh, planning meetings, retrospectives, uh, all of these, uh, you know, things that we'll, we'll try and do uh, uh, to make sure that the, the location that is not sitting next to the customer has that opportunity to put that front face, uh, uh, you know, forward. The, the other aspects, especially as, uh, as teams, uh, distributed teams in particular, glow, grow larger, you know, when, when you're talking of 20, 30 people in all across two locations, uh, regardless of which other tools, you know, in, at least in my experience that you use uh, for, for communication, emails will still be a big chunk of, uh, you know, it will, will still be the big medium in which people will ask questions or ask for opinions or, you know, um, yeah, make, you know, s uh, circulate de decisions and so on. And, and there it's important that, that, that the team approaches email communication in a structured manner. Um, so I've been in situations where, where we haven't paid attention to, to, to email that's coming on from the other side enough. And, uh, uh, and, and suddenly it happens that there was something important that somebody had asked you know, last night. We didn't look at it the whole day today. And, and the next opportunity we'll get to look at is uh, you know, 36 hours later or 48 hours later as compared to when they had asked it. And those sort of things can very quickly reduce trust, reduce, uh, you know, confidence and so on. So uh, we've, you know, just, just to, and so that's, that's it's important to, uh, or, you know, approach it in a, in a very structured manner. A couple of things that, that have worked for us is uh, on projects we've taken, we've almost set time aside, maybe the first 30 minutes uh, even even before the the morning stand up of a team, we spend the time for everyone in the team to read and respond to their emails. You know, for example, uh, on another team, you know, Tarang and I w uh, were on recently. We we had a couple of people take over the ownership of being email shepherds, which basically means that they'll keep track of. Oh, you know, these were these were three questions that that came came through today. In, in the technology choices area, these, these three questions were around QA processes or tools area. Let's ensure that somebody in the team has signed up to, to, uh, to look at it and respond to it within a day or two, so that it doesn't get lost. And this may seem like a trivial thing, right? Yeah, everyone manages their email, whether you're distributed or not. But, but at least we found that just that simple thing of you know, an acknowledgement that goes back saying, yes, we've, we've seen it, we're working on it, or hey, here is the response. I think that makes a big difference to that trust level that, that you're going to have. So we do, as, as project managers, both of us, we do pay a lot of attention to it. Sometimes, you know, it, our team members will feel like we're being a little anal about it, but, uh, you know, we, we, we're just not going to underestimate the, the impact of that medium of communication, regardless of how many video conversations you're going to have. Um, and, and coming back to a question that uh, one of you guys asked earlier about, uh, you know, there, there are, when you have a distributed team, you will have to tweak your, uh, you know, your, your practices, whether it's stand-ups or retrospectives or planning meetings, a little bit to account for the fact that you have people in, in both locations. So, uh, you know, for example, in retrospectives, it would mean, you know, using using you know com using web based tools that allow people to to look at points being being put up by both sides uh, having video on both sides having facilitators on both sides who've earlier met up and uh, and you know synced up notes about what what structure is going to be followed and so on um, but even other things like like it's important for uh, for you to try and try and find avenues to exchange feedback between members of the two teams, um, of the two distributed teams, or broadly sort of seek feedback from the other side of the world uh, about how things are going and so on. So it's important to keep that in mind that, uh, 
that those small tweaks are uh, are are important. All right. So so we've gotten through the early days. We've done all the right things. Now the the project and the teams have moved to a steady state mode. So we're not going to spend a lot of time on this, but just uh, you know some some quick things to keep in mind. Uh, we find that rotations often sort of uh, start to disappear. It's the first few weeks of the project. There'll be some travel happening, uh, but you know they they don't. Uh, don't happen uh, consistently throughout. So, so again, something to keep in mind. Just make sure that uh, the rotations happen throughout that that life cycle of the project. Uh, another important thing is to celebrate small successes together, whether it's small milestones that have been reached, or whether it's you know uh, you know just any any kind of uh, positive thing that has happened. Just celebrating that together over a long period of time. Again, doing that by default using some of the the channels or tools that we have mentioned in the handout. Uh, we found that again to be to be critical to for continued success. So, so just uh, just recently, a project that I was on, it was a it was a team distributed across uh, six cities, and we did our uh, we had our go live uh, uh, go, go live celebration go go live basically occur. Uh, it was a big public go live, so it was a big event. And uh, when that happened, uh, we were all on a video call for, for three or four hours to, to ensure that everything goes fine. And at the end of those four hours, when we knew that it was, you know, it was finally live, um, uh, we, we had you know, people in, the, in, the, in Istanbul and, and in Brussels where, where the client stakeholders were. They, they actually had champagne bottles ready, uh, uh, you know, arranged to celebrate and they, they opened up the bottles on video and poured glasses and you know ch cheers to to everyone on calls and just those small things you know cutting birthday cakes um, you know while the camera is on on the other side just those small things make it uh, make it you know one team and and finally uh, maybe maybe somewhat controversial for for some folks here but uh, while you're doing that distributed project keep looking for opportunities to not have to distribute it distribution uh, is hard it's a lot of work. It comes with lots of trade-offs. So if if there are ways in which it, uh, you know the work can be largely moved to one location or a team can be co-located, don't lose sight of the fact that uh, you know you can still look for opportunities to do that. You don't have to do uh, that model for forever. Yeah, and in our experience, you know, on, on most project after uh, after about six months, nine months, there there is usually a quite a clear opportunity to try and reduce the distribution. If you have three locations, it's possible to do it in two locations. Uh, if you have two, it's possible to do it in one location. So it does ease things considerably whenever you can do it. Depends on the context. Okay. That's one more question. Um, with the disability team, we're sitting with us tonight. So, how would you accommodate the demo? Sprint demo. So, typically, if you wait for the demo team, the time zone differences, right? You are facing a table, right? So, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, so I'll repeat the question. Uh, so, in, uh, and just to make sure I've understood it right, when there's a distributed team, um, you know, spread across, particularly, uh, you know, lots of time zone difference uh, between the two. How do you uh, manage demos? Uh, because, uh, you know, if you're waiting for the other side to be up, you could lose lose some hours until you're able to do a demo. Is that is that the question? It's not hours, probably even a day. Let's say the last day, right? So it's not over for the other team. Right? You need to put up. Assume that you're putting up a sprint demo on every sprint completion. Right? Yeah, so we're, we're, we're not even looking at it as a monolithic thing that we do a sprint demo and the entire team presents everything all at once. You know, one will we'll look to just present things as they are ready. Uh, so it doesn't matter where they got ready from. But of course, if you're presenting to the client stakeholders who need to provide feedback, then yes, it, it will sometimes mean a 24-hour gap until we can get the right people, right? I mean, uh, until the right stakeholders are there, the, the purpose of the, the demo isn't served, right? But the so, sorry, but the, but the important thing is that when when you are demoing, when you are showcasing, and if you're doing it formally, it's important for the offshore team to directly talk and and present the features that they've worked on, and for the onshore team to 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 directly talk about the features that they've. And a day, which you know. Yeah, but the end, end of sprint, end of sprint is, a, is a notional thing, right? I mean, you can just decide that 8 a.m. U.S. time is when the demos will be, and 
whatever work uh, has got done till that time on on a monday morning is is what counts as a sprint on both sides so, uh, one more question so on the uh, the skills or uh, you know the expertise my you know the distributed team has could be on a module let's say at a platform level driver level so it's very hard to form a team you know which has these roles is that a practical problem do you have any thoughts we usually solve that by uh, by rotation by by ensuring that a few people who who uh, who have worked on those areas work from the other location for a few weeks or months um uh, but but we haven't experienced a lot of that honestly we we haven't experienced that there is something that the you know people only in india can do and something that people only in the us can do all right questions any other some metrics but where there is some metrics some measurements apart from velocity and the internal retrospective uh, that you came across during it uh, specifically yeah. you know in terms of how the distributed teams are doing in general project when they are running in agile yeah so that that's a whole different topic in so uh, you can share your experiences And no, but that, that's very different from the you know we, we are focusing on what what is unique when you're doing distributed agile uh, you know in in just doing in running projects in an agile manner there are you know you think you look at measuring different things and and projecting it differently but that's a, a very different topic let's talk about it offline but take or, questions on or on if the, the organizers give us 30 more minutes we could uh, we could talk about it. yeah in the back Have you had situations where you had really, really, really distributed teams, like for example, team members sitting in US and in Europe and you know in the Asia Pacific region? So that means you don't have any kind of you know common time at all. So the champagne celebration example we were talking about, there was uh, Tokyo, there was uh, Pune, Bangalore, Istanbul, Brussels, and San Francisco. Some common time, like you know, people were sitting in India who are late. <laughs> okay, we're we're almost we're actually out of time. So, but you know, reality is that in those sort of cases, we can't get everyone together for for everything. We will have to distribute the communication when possible. One last question: Did you face any specific challenges in uh, becoming feature teams while you are working? Uh, actually, I might be more involved answer. So, should we? Because there is a 15 minute uh, break now, so we could you know, sure. we could we could answer some questions. All right. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Um, let's carry on the conversation in the lobby. Thank you. Thanks.